uh, Hubert Humphrey. But anything we can do to uh, discourage them will be, I'm sure, wholeheartedly appreciated by most of the nation. So if you can get across, make your voice heard, it might possibly have some effect. Convention week took place really over four days. And over those four days, there were small protests, big protests. Probably the most memorable events took place Wednesday, August 28th, in the middle of Grant Park at the Band Shell, when there was a permitted legal rally. It was the only legal permit the demonstrators had. And it went on all afternoon. And to be frank, sometimes it was pretty boring, and sometimes it was pretty uh, hard to hear what people were saying. And you see about, oh, 10, 15,000 people at the most milling around, listening, cheering, uh, kind of waiting for something to happen. And of course, things would happen. South Michigan and West on State. Now when we get there, they are trying to reach their communication to find out if we're going to be stopped at that point. By August 1968, America had been seeing major protests for almost eight years. Some people were very tired of those protests. Chicago's Mayor Richard J. Daley definitely was one of those people. He did not want to see protests in his city. On the other hand, anti-war activists believed that they were just getting started, that the war in Vietnam had to be stopped, and that it was up to the American people to go to the streets to make it come to an end. So hippies, yippies, militants, revolutionaries, radicals, moderates, liberals, even conservatives, all felt something had to be done about that war. When those two forces met in the streets of Chicago, well, all hell broke loose. By 1968, there were many different kinds of anti-war activists. The major group was called the National Mobilization Against the War in Vietnam, or MOB. And this was a group that was mainly older people. It wasn't the stereotypical 20-year-old hippie. It was people in suits, women in dresses, people from all kinds of professions. These were people who worked more or less within the system trying to make a change. There were also radicals. Perhaps the most famous were the new leftists called the Students for a Democratic Society. By 1968, they had begun to give up on electoral politics and were looking for a very militant, radical solution. But there were other groups as well. The yippies were a kind of countercultural group half hippie, half new left activists, who thought that they could present a real alternative that maybe young people would get interested. Rock music, dancing, theater in the park, a different way to think about protest. When anti-war demonstrators came to Chicago, their intention was to go to the International Amphitheater where the actual convention was taking place. But they could get no permits, and police and National Guardsmen and the military made sure that they could not get within miles of the place. So the anti-war movement was in a kind of strategic quandary. Where to go? Well, they decided one of the places they could make their stand was downtown Chicago, near the hotels where the delegates were staying. So the Conrad Hilton and others were where almost every delegate was staying. So if you can't get to the actual amphitheater where the actual convention is being held, at least you can witness in front of the people who are going to make the decisions at the International Amphitheater. So protests took place downtown Chicago. Tell me a way to get rid of Richard Daly as the mayor of Chicago without the political process. When you have thousands of people brought together, it's really hard to keep order. It's really hard to keep discipline. And sometimes it's really hard to get people just to pay attention. So if you look at Chicago 68, you'll see people dutifully listening sometimes to speakers, but also people playing with bubbles on the sidelines, or chanting, or climbing trees, or wetting their feet in the fountains. It was a scene, it was a kind of happening. And that's what most anti-war movements were actually like. Big protests with people doing all sorts of things, just trying in some small way to be heard.
presidential nominating convention goes on for several days, but kind of at the heart of any nominating convention is the actual nomination. And in August 1968, that actual nomination was going to take place on Wednesday, the 28th. And so the protesters thought that was the moment when the maximal amount of attention would be put in front of the American people. And indeed, some 80 million people will watch on television to see the nominee of the Democratic Party. Everybody knew that August 28th was going to be the day of confrontation. It was going to be the day with the most protesters, and it was going to be the day with the most forces of law and order assembled to keep those protesters in line. So not only were there thousands and thousands of Chicago Police Department officials in the streets with batons ready to do what they had to do to keep order, there was also thousands of National Guardsmen with, at that point, fixed bayonets and barbed wire jeeps also there to keep order. There was also army reserves. Now, they were not actually in Grant Park, but they were on the ready. So you had as many as 25,000 people ready to keep order against the protest that, in the end, only encompassed about 15,000 people. But it would be a confrontation that day, and it would be a memorable one. I think for Americans watching the protests in Chicago, especially that Wednesday, August 28th, it, it was quite a scene. It, was, it made a lot of people sad and it made a lot of people angry that the United States would see such polarizations in the streets where you'd have anti-war protesters, overwhelmingly peaceful protesters, it's important to emphasize that, met with such massive force. And what it showed was that a lot of Americans were afraid that there was chaos in the streets that there was disorder, that there was anarchy. And Americans are often very anxious about that kind of scene. And we saw that in Chicago. When you look at Chicago 68, on the one hand, you can see a kind of clear divide between people who are for the war and people who are against the war. But it was more than just a policy difference. It was a cultural difference. You mostly had working class cops who believed in law and order, who overwhelmingly themselves had served in the military at one point in their lives, or whose sons were serving, or their brothers or their fathers had been in World War II. And on the other side, you had college-educated people, people who were thought it was good to question authority, who thought it was right to exercise freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, who looked at the world differently. And we're familiar in 2018 with those kind of cultural clashes, but they kind of erupt in the most visible way in 1968. It's not just a demonstration about policy. It's a demonstration about how should society work? What does patriotism mean? What does democracy mean? It was the biggest questions being asked in the most visceral way. People are taking back their country. You know, when we start taking back our country from the 3% that owns the country, you're going to have to decide, are you going to load this thing and use it? If you're not going to load this thing and use it, then you ought to put it down. After several thousand protesters had ended up in Michigan Avenue, you, you start to see the police do their best to clear the streets. And at first, they mostly act with a fair amount of discipline. They've got skirmish lines. They, they're using their clubs to butt people, which is proper police procedure. But police don't act like soldiers. They're not in perfect regimen and discipline. And you can watch a few police officers. You could almost just see the red in their eyes. They've just had enough. And they maybe heard a curse word, or maybe somebody spit at them, uh, maybe even nothing, to be frank. They just lose it. And it's really, at first, just like a handful of police officers out of, again, hundreds of cops lined up. 
but a few cops just break the police line and they start clubbing people, not using the butt end of their clubs, but swinging them like baseball bats and cracking heads with them. And you can watch the police commander, it's really, it's really wild to watch this police commander yell, you know, basically get back in line, you know, don't, don't do that, but he has no control. And once that kind of cracks, once that, that tension erupts, things just, just go to hell in a handbag really fast. And for about 20 minutes, all of a sudden, there's just, there's just chaos and violence and clubbing and blood flying and the police. And again, it's not all by any means. It's really just probably at the most a few dozen are just letting loose with fury at these people they think are not acting as good patriotic Americans. things that's again really hard to wrap your head around is what is it the anti-war demonstrators hope to accomplish like why are these protests what are they trying to do well to some extent they're trying to get tens of millions of Americans to think about the war in Vietnam and to think critically about it so that's why they're in Chicago and when the police grow so angry and so violent and confront protesters and bloody their heads to some extent many of the protesters see this as a kind of metaphor or parallel to what's happening in Vietnam. That freedom and democracy are being repressed. And so you get this ironic chant that takes place in the middle of Michigan Avenue during this protest when the police are actually beating protesters. We have people sitting down in the streets using a kind of civil disobedience like the civil rights movement did. And as they're sitting in the street, they raise their fists and they shout over and over, the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching, meaning the whole world is watching on television, citizens trying to exercise their democratic rights for freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, being repressed by the police department of the city of Chicago. That was a tough image. The legacy of the protests of 1968 are a mixed one. On the one hand, they show that citizens do have the audacity to challenge the status quo, to say that conventional political thinking is wrong and that it's up to the American people to do something about it. That's as American as apple pie and has been with us from the 18th century and the Tea Party of the 18th century and the Tea Party of the 20th and 21st century. But the other legacy is how hard it is to do that most Americans actually, when they watched the protests in Chicago in 1968, felt that those citizens who were in the streets were wrong to do so, that they were too disruptive, that the police were right to crack their heads. And so I think we are still wrestling with the legacy of that event and the legacy of social change movements. How much protest is okay with the American people? What kind of protests are okay? When we see them on television, do we say, Darn those kids, can't they just go to school and be quiet? Or do we say, good on you, here's America at its best practicing democracy. That's a conversation we're still having.